Welcome to the Sano Genetics Podcast. I'm Patrick, the co-founder and CEO of Sano. Our guest today is Ella Rode. She is the playwright behind The Phlebotomist, which has received some rave reviews, including from The Guardian, calling it a gasp-worthy dystopian thriller. And it's also had a couple of mentions in The Economist, not just for the writing and acting, but for some of the interesting ethical questions around genetics and genetic testing that it tackles. Uh, so it's really great to have Ella on the podcast. Thank you so much. For those of us who have not had a chance to see the play, would you mind just giving us a quick overview of what it's all about? Uh, maybe no spoilers in case people do decide to uh, listen to the BBC version that's coming out soon. Um, of course. Well, it's very nice to be here, so thank you for having me, uh, first of all. Yes, I can give you a little overview. I'll try not to spoil anything. Great. Um, so the kind of general concept is that it's a... The phlebotomist imagines a world where um, genetic testing and you know, a pre-diagnostic testing for disease has become so culturally mainstream that everybody has had a genetic test done and um, people have started to rank people according to their perceived genetic quality and a kind of rating system has developed as an easy way of understanding people's genetic quality because obviously when you get a genetic test done the amount of information you're given is huge and as a kind of way of consolidating that information people have started to use a rating system from zero to ten to help people to kind of understand what their genetic test means but this has kind of gone a bit viral and a bit wrong I suppose and people have ended up starting to use that to discriminate against people. So people who are at the lower end of the spectrum would find it very difficult to find work because companies wouldn't want somebody who was likely to take loads of sick days or had a predisposition to lots of different mental health issues. And people who are at the top end of the spectrum find life easy because obviously their life expectancy is longer and also then have got less of a predisposition to various different problems. And so it would be easy for them to get health insurance and uh, just general insurance, mortgages. They might find it easier in the world of dating. And so it's a kind of like broad world of the play. So it's kind of like now with a twist, I suppose. Yeah, um, that's fascinating. The, the, yeah, the story kind of centres around three young people, a couple, Aaron and B, and their friend Shah, as they try and navigate this pretty strange new social order. Um, and try to live like meaningful, normal lives within it. Um, but we see increasingly how difficult that is. Try not to give anything away. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. And, and I mean, some of these things are, they call it a dystopia, but some of these things aren't so far from reality, are they? I mean, the inspiration, you can see that in the coming decades, we, we may actually see this kind of future, right? It's Hopefully it's not going to be that bad, but people in the U.S., for example, are always very concerned about uh, discrimination from insurance companies. Where, where did the inspiration from this actually come from? Was it these kind of larger events or was it something in your life or what was it? It's a mixture of things, really. I think I've been absorbing a lot of that kind of information about discrimination globally um, and had a residual realisation of how difficult it is to live privately in this in, in nowadays and um, so I suppose that's but it probably came from a general environment of that but actually specifically the reason why I decided to write about this was because um because I found out that it was possible so I didn't actually know that you could test right you know, diseases um like this until several probably about five years ago maybe six years ago now and the reason why I knew about it was because somebody that I was dating when I was at university he was a bioengineer well he was an engineer he's now in bioengineering and he um he was looking at what he wants to do after uni so I was applying to drama school and kind of doing all my applications to be an actor and he was looking at all these amazing uh, biotech programs and I remember us watching this video together explaining how you could do pre-symptomatic genetic testing for cancer and we were watching him and he, kind of his reaction was wow this is absolutely amazing and uh, this is what i want to do with my life and my reaction was like wow this is amazing <laughs> right. this is amazing but like isn't this really ethically complicated and my imagination went into the kind of like dystopia zone and i suppose his went into the like no i want to help help people with this zone and um which probably shows how different we were but yeah i think that was like the starting point for it and i started to do lots of research after that point about what was possible and realize just quite how quickly this area of scientific research was moving and uh, you know it wasn't that i was like oh i think i want to stop this it was like, i was actually just amazed by it and 
I don't want to stop it. I think it's incredible. Yeah, but actually, I think that the kind of creative in me thought, how where can we push this to its its worst extreme, and what what happens if, you know, what happens if it is used in the wrong way? Right. It, it is like you have the power to just imagine this alternate universe, right? And who knows if we'll end up there or not? But it's interesting to just take some of these things to their logical conclusion. Yeah, absolutely. And also sometimes they're not so logical conclusion. I think that, you know, one of the most amazing things about working in the arts and being able to make up stories is that we can actually just explore versions of things that we can imagine. They don't even have to be that realistic. I mean, I think that the the world in the phlebotomist isn't that far from reality. And that is, you know, one version of it. There's obviously another version of that story where we push it even further. There's another version where we don't. You know, there's a kind of, I think, right. that, you know... Paths. Absolutely. I think that um, I feel very blessed that I work in a, I work in the, a kind of industry where the currency is the imagination. And so, you know, what we have is we are given the opportunity to ask what if, what if all the time and push things in different directions. In the spirit of that, what are some decisions that we, uh, the collective we as humanity might make in the next few years that will decide, you think, whether we head towards the future that you described or, or some different one? Um, I think there are some things that are kind of legal and, you know, require government intervention and that those things are, are confidentiality laws and right. a broader understanding in the general public of what is currently possible in terms of genetics and also what their rights are when it comes to confidentiality and also, you know, what steps that they can take to make sure that they aren't putting information out there that can then be manipulated. Um, and those things, are, I'd say, are, are up to governments to right. you know put in place um, and then i think there are some slightly broad, more broader cultural things i mean one of the things that the play explores is not just the fact that this science is available it's just it's the fact that it, it intersects with a culture of judgment and ranking and right. discrimination and kind of uh, an obsession with investment in re and return and a kind of almost commodifying of human life and i think that that is something which is a cultural trend you know, we, we don't we can't have laws to we don't have laws to prevent culture from right. developing. And actually, for me, that is almost the more interesting side of it, because for some reason, we, it's very often we can't really explain why certain cultural trends go viral. You know, why suddenly one day we're all obsessed with a particular thing or, you know, how, how you know, in the world of the play, suddenly everybody's completely obsessed with health and completely obsessed with the future and, you know, what their bodies are going to be in 10 years time. And I don't know exactly how we prevent against that. That makes quite, sense. And, and yeah. we do see these patterns all when we look at social media in the last 10 years, there's been an incredible shift in how we we rank ourselves against the world around us. Right. So it's not so far fetched to imagine that health might move that direction. Absolutely. And like even so, I've got younger siblings, half siblings and step siblings. So they've grown up with social media much more prevalent um, and watching their the way that they think about themselves and the way that they interact with their peers through social media and this it's and this culture of liking and ranking and followers and a, a kind of quantifying of social worth i mean i imagine that's probably subliminally fed its way into the, the play the fact that i've been watching them battle that and yeah i think that we things do just take off don't they yes um, they do yeah and i think it would, it would be really wrong for government to come in and say no we cannot use social media no there will be no more you know ranking of photos because that would right. be ridiculous but actually it's very difficult to know how we contain that no that makes sense in in the play you go into not just predisposition to illness but also personality traits and those sorts of things did you know before you set off on this journey about some of the science behind genetic testing and that you actually could predict personality traits and these sorts of things or was that a moment of kind of going down the rabbit hole for you and and realizing all these things one after another yeah it was definitely a rabbit hole moment because i started off knowing that about cancer you know different right. types of cancers that you could test for and then i kind of started to do a bit more reading and realized there were other things too and then started to look at all the, the other other um traits that were being mapped and um, the more I dug, the more I found. And I think what was amazing for me was realising quite how quickly the research was moving. So actually every week there seemed to be more stuff that people were right. understanding. I mean, that is what's incredible about science, isn't it? It's just like everybody's constantly building all the time. It's, it's, so, um, it's so alive. Have um, you followed the, 
the gene editing scandals in the news or else very recently there's a company in the US that said they were going to start helping people test embryos for intelligence have you followed either of those stories I haven't followed that story but I now I definitely would like to Yeah um, so there's there's a company in the US a lot of scientists obviously have been speaking out against it but they're suggesting that they can do some kind of screening using something called a polygenic risk score to measure intelligence um and that they, it could be applied to embryos for a screening process and it, and it sounds like mm-hmm. something that uh would fit right into your story. Yeah. You know I'm not surprised really. I mean I think you know if you can screen if we know that these things are contained within our genes and you can screen for disease in embryos and obviously you can screen for that too. It doesn't for me that doesn't seem such a leap is it's just about the fact that people that are able to are allowed to do it which I then find a bit icky. Um, yes, and the, and yeah. the people would choose to do it as well and and make a business out of it. You know, there's the government piece but then there's also you know there's some kind of base level of ethics I think that for a business you should hold yourself to. Yeah, I think so. Um I think it's a difficult one though, isn't it? Because like there are some so some particular diseases that if you were able you know that you're able to screen for or it feels relatively clear cut you think well actually it maybe wouldn't be maybe I wouldn't feel comfortable bringing a baby into that world into the world knowingly with that disease right. and i feel like that feels quite it's still complicated it's still bloody ethically complicated but it's right. not like it's not like oh um you know it doesn't feel too difficult to make that decision i think but there are other it's really difficult to know where you then draw the line because it's it's an obviously massive sliding scale And then actually when you get to something like intelligence you think well actually do do I have the right to play god in this instance and should we really be selecting yeah should we really be designing our children like that Yeah and and I think um, you put it really well there's a a continuum of all of these different traits or conditions and where everybody mm-hmm. draws the line is is so different I mean we uh, in my research capacity work with a lot of families with rare conditions and yeah. actually every, everyone that you ask has a different outlook on it whether you know whether editing or early detection is the is the right thing or the wrong thing to do so it is it's it's really hard to to draw a line in the sand absolutely and as you were well, when we were in doing the run of the play uh, the original run of the play about a year ago i am um, so i do quite a lot of support work with young people and adults with different disabilities and um who need you know, do kind of support work and i went away to do a weekend of that during the run of the play last time and i had this real realization when i was there having a lovely weekend we took them on a camping trip and i was like none of these people would exist in the world of the play because right. they would have been screened out you know actually some of them would but obviously because of anomalies and everything but actually i found it so depressing and so sad thinking that actually these like wonderful humans that i was spending the weekend with would not exist in this world where everybody is able to choose um and that felt very sad to me Yeah and also this idea that you kind of reduce it, in the play you reduce it all to a single number I thought that was really fascinating to me that actually it's an incredibly complicated set of characteristics or traits but at the end of the day it just spits out a number that yeah. that is in a way kind of a measure of your worth right Yeah absolutely and I feel like that is um you know where that came from is this kind of everybody having a rating on every app right kind of, uh thing you know like actually we seem to reduce ourselves to these numbers all the time but actually reducing your self as a as a you kind of social worth to a number feels like another step yeah well you um, you mentioned um dating yeah. dating apps and those sorts of things earlier and and actually a lot of people have suggested that genetics should should and i think there are actually some that already exist we can look it up afterwards but dating apps that purport to use your genetic data to determine who they're going to match you with. I think the science really in most cases uh, unless it's a recessive disease doesn't doesn't really work for that, but they seem to think that you can um do some kind of complicated matching and you actually pick who's going to meet each other based on their genetics, which that seems really kind of crazy and bizarre to me as well but it makes you think about what if someone that you fell in love with actually the algorithm decided in an alternate universe that you weren't compatible with and you never got matched with one another for example. Mm. Yeah, I um I mean I think that's I find it fascinating. I find it slightly scary but I also find it slightly hilarious just because I feel like, you know, if you even look at the oldest oldest literature from 
you know, the Greeks, right? <laughs> or Chaucer, right. you know, like everybody's been trying to understand love since the beginning of time. It's probably the most discussed thing in any art is people trying to um, create a, an algorithm for love. Right. And this is just another version of that. It's just like, you know, we've got more information about ourselves and about the world now than we have, have ever had. And so people are trying to use, you know, that app as an example, I think, of people trying to quantify the unquantifiable. You know, I'm not saying that there aren't loads and loads of scientific things at play when people fall in love with each other, because it is a chemical yeah, thing. At the end know, of there the are day. loads and loads of stats to support that. I, mean, I don't think it's random by any means, but I do think it is. It seems slightly crazy to me that people are using genes as a, a, like a matchmaking thing. Though, I mean, I don't know the science behind it. I'm sure there is like, quite a lot of genetic stuff at play as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think where some people have, uh, and again, it's this question of where do you draw the line, but what some people, where it's been, according to some people, successful, is if you know there's a risk of a severe condition and you can at least counsel the couple to let them know that there's a, if it's a you know, recessive disease, maybe there's a 25% chance, and then you have information to do something. But it's just as you said earlier, there's this line in between of most things um, are not black and white. Most things are in the middle. And who decides and how do we decide, I think, is really the hard question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think, you know, the reason why I wrote about it was because it, I find it complicated and because I don't think it's black and white and I don't think there's an easy answer. You know, not because I think that that I have an answer to any of it, if you know what I mean. I think, you know, the, the most interesting things to write about, to interrogate, are the, the complicated things like this, where it really isn't clear what's right and what's wrong. And, yeah, I think that there are certain circumstances where it's super, super useful to know to know what you're in for, um, or to know if you're a carrier of something, and if it's going to affect your uh, reproduction or whatever, that, that stuff feels really important. But actually, there's, it's all the other stuff. And I'm, sh- I'm sure all of the everyone in the audience and and all of that the actors probably leave with more questions than answers at the end, right? Everybody had there are moments where you think like, oh, I never really thought about it that way, yeah. And and everybody experiences that a little bit differently. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that I um I actually had a, a moment when we first went into rehearsals for the play when I thought, oh gosh, I've created a really negative thing here right 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 um and that's not really what i set out to do what i set out to do is to start a conversation and was to interrogate something and start a debate and what i've actually ended up with is a dystopia more right. or less and um now i'm not so bothered by it but i actually think that i wouldn't i really hope that people do come out with questions and they come out and they go and do a bit of research and a bit of reading and they make their own minds up about how they feel about it yeah it's not supposed to be an anti anti genetic show. It's supposed right. to be like a or oh, let's let's interrogate where our cultural trends intersect with the science that's going on right now. Kind of yeah, show. and well, it's it's often not as interesting if you try to caveat everything and consider every point. There's a real place for actually just taking you know, for the sake of uh, argument, a slightly extreme view on it and just asking the question, what do we learn from this? Mm-hmm, absolutely. I, I personally really like, uh, I'm a big fan of dystopias. I find them interesting. So I, yeah, I, are, you a, are you a dystopia fan or is this like, because this, this is the first kind of major show you've had. Is that right? Is, and is, is it going to be all dystopias from here on out or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, this is actually my first play. So it's the first play that I wrote. Really? That's amazing. Um, yeah. Thanks. Well, I, um, well like, I, I trained as an actor. I did an English degree and then I trained as an actor. And then when I was kind of waiting around for acting work, I ended up writing this play. And then now I'm mainly writing. But um, the other stuff that I'm working on is a mixture. I think there aren't really dystopias in there um, in my, on my slate at the moment, but they are quite a lot of them use current science as a starting point or at least some kind of scientific question so um one of the projects i'm working on actually i've been working on for a little while and it's suddenly become a lot more felt a lot more um present is a female gender testing in sport Um, absolutely with the castor semenya story absolutely yeah so i've been kind of cooking up a project on that for about a year now year and a half and now that's all kind of come to the fore um and that's been well, interesting and slightly devastating seeing that yeah. play out in the media. Uh, what are your so thoughts on that? Ultimate, I think it's really sad. I was really, really it disappointed is. by the ruling. I feel that, oh gosh, I could have a whole other podcast about yeah. it. I feel like, I feel that the way that we kind of 
uh, the way that she has been treated is awful, kind of first of all, but also this kind of need to categorise right. um, people is very, very complicated. I think that um, that these arbitrary lines that we draw in the sand, I, I actually think the way that she's been treated is very unscientific. Yeah, um, absolutely. Ironically, you know, we're using science to try to categorise humanity, but actually the way that this has been dealt with is the least scientific thing I've ever seen in my life. So, um, yeah, but maybe that's yeah. a conversation for another day. Well, um, and, yeah, it, it probably is. I mean, and, and just her personal story, it's so, it's not a, it's not like it's an isolated event. I mean, her entire life has been having to deal with these challenges. And I mean, I, I, I yeah, I think it's uh, just on a single human being level. It's really hard. It's just hard to hear these and then hear the outcome that it was absolutely i also think this changing of the goalposts over the last year has been really difficult as well i mean you know her being told that she's allowed to compete and then they're changing the, the amount of testosterone right. you're allowed in your system it's like basically just being messed around by the authorities and i really understand again it's it's, it's another issue which is very complicated and and it, it's not you know it's not straightforward and which is probably why I want to write about it. Right. It, it does actually really impact, you know, it impacts real people, as we've seen with Casa Semenya. Like, she's been dicks around. Um, yeah. And, yeah, that's tough. Yeah, and, and you're right. It's, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we could have someone on that would take the completely opposite stance. And it's just a complicated question, isn't it? But on the individual level, you just, you never want to see anybody treated like that. Absolutely not. Yeah, no, I do appreciate that more broadly about trying to, kind of protect the female category in sport is something that that, that is the ultimate goal and it, it's I, th- I think done with the right for the right reasons but I think it's been done in the wrong way and actually right. it, it's chaos really because I don't yeah, know it's, it's, it's just really been, kind of, it's been it. like watching a yeah watching a car crash right um <laughs> yeah yeah so is, is that your main project right now or do you have a couple other things that you're working on as well no, I've got quite a lot of different things at different stages. So that's that's in a very it's very early stages, I'd say that project. And I've also got another. I've got a TV. Well, we're actually doing a TV adaptation of the Phlebotomist. But oh, great! It's really, really early on at the moment, so I can't really speak that much about it. But we are cooking that up, um, and I'm also doing a um, a different another TV series of Channel Four, which is it's actually about memory. New, memory. Oh, interesting. Um, so it's got another something else quite sciencey, but the story itself is a very kind of human story, small human story. So it's not really dystopia. It's more just like looking at the potential for neurological memory erasure and like looking at how we can suppress and erase trauma. Wow. Um, which is yeah, really fascinating. Is that, is that um, possible? Um, most there's people. I'm sure there are people working on it. Yeah, they've been working on it for a while. I mean, they've been doing experiments in mice and other mammals for a while. It's not currently, as far as I know, being trialled in humans, but um, right. but the potential is pretty huge. I mean, I think they've worked out, they worked out how to do it. It's more about, again, it's not the ethical one. It's like, you know, what do we do when we if we snip out a bit of somebody's right. memory? memory? And, you know, should we? The can we, should we question? Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah wow. there are a couple of other plays which are a lot less sciencey, I'd say. They're kind of... They're more human questions, maybe. I mean, really, I think when you break anything down, you could probably turn it into a scientific interrogation because it's all linked up. Um, yes, but I'd say awesome. those are the projects right. that are using a kind of current scientific debate at their core, and the other ones are much more about asking questions about... One of them is about the taboo of regretting having a child, and the other one is uh, about altruism. So they're kind of a bit of a mix, I'd say. Yeah, great. Yeah. That's fascinating. I mean, all of these, I always come at these things with a genetics hat on, but there's a yeah. there's a small role that genetics has to play in all of that. Altruism is one of the very fascinating questions around genetics because you it doesn't seem obvious uh, from first principles why it would happen, but if you dig mm-hmm. into it, then it, it does start to make sense. Absolutely. That was one of the reasons why I started writing about it, actually. I think ultimately the play is not going to be sci- like about the science at all. But the, one of the reasons why I started to get really fascinated by it was because I was, I was like, um, yeah, desperate to try and work out whether or not altruism was an evolutionary thing. You know, whether it, right. it, it was, I mean, it must be if it exists, it must be. But you're like, uh, yeah, I was trying yeah. to reconcile this kind of selfish gene debate with actually altruistic behaviour and 
you know, it's the idea that the genes are selfish, but we don't have to be. <laughs> right, right. It's some emergent <laughs> property. Yeah, we don't have to be. Yeah, that yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's really, really interesting. Well, fascinating. Mm. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll definitely um, keep up with that and share it when all these things come out. I know we've got to close up here because we're running out of time. Do you um, want to share your Twitter or website or anything like that so people can follow your work? Yes, please. I mean, I don't have a website. I'm not very good with tech, ironically, maybe. But I am. I can be found on Twitter at Ella underscore Road. And I think that's pretty much the only social media I use. Great. So, yeah, find me there. And I normally post about work and upcoming stuff. Wonderful. Thanks so much <laughs> for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all very much for listening. As always, cool. you can send your feedback, including any questions you have, guests you'd like to see on the show, or anything else to podcast at sonogenetics.com. We'll read and respond to every email. If you would like to get in touch with Ella or follow her work, she has given her Twitter out. If you like the podcast, we'd love if you could share it with a friend or leave us a review on iTunes. And then finally, feel free to visit our website, sonogenetics.com, to learn more about some of the research projects we're working on and some of these interesting topics we discussed today through the blog or to find a link to the podcast. Great. Thanks so much. And thanks, Ella, very much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Speak to you soon. <laughs>